Um, there's some people, I don't know. Hey guys on Zoom, can I do an audio test? Are you guys hearing me okay? Yeah, audio is good. All right, okay, and we are recording. Um, so we'll just get going here. There's a few of us in the project lab, but I turned off the video. Well, you guys can focus on the slides and you can hopefully ask questions in the score because I'm not going to be monitoring the Zoom chat. So if you guys have any questions, I think it's easier in the score for me. Um, so this is two part series. I have no idea how many of you are interested in the second part. The second part is going to be a bit more exotic. This is going to be kind of a run of the mill uh, personal finance. And I'm just gonna start with, I guess, the end in a way, uh, what I think should be some takeaways of this talk. And uh, it differs from person to person, uh, what they understand about their personal finances. I know some people who are extremely obsessed with it and some people that don't know much about it and they kind of ignore it completely. And I guess my, my feel here is that I want to hopefully establish with you guys what, what's your relationship with money, finance, kind of the economy, how things work. And uh, this talk was actually inspired um, from a Stanford course that uh, I think is being taught in September. It's CS007. No idea why it's computer science. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's called Personal Finance for Engineers. I put links everywhere. Um, and if you guys are more interested, I think you should just follow the links. And the way I went about it was, uh, what do I want to know? What, what would I have told myself when I graduated? This kind of, I'm not sure. I tried to figure out if this is a Bruce Lee quote, but as far as I can tell, nobody <laughs> knows. Uh, they have contacted the Bruce Lee Foundation and the Bruce Lee Foundation is working on it. But uh, yeah, we don't know. So I just put TBD. Um, this is the storyline for this talk. Um, it's as we go through it, hopefully it's gonna make sense. Um, in the beginning, I'm, I'll talk about what were my goals kind of when I started my journey uh, and then kind of how I broke them down. And I think hopefully some each one of these bullet points will have some interesting uh, information for you guys, we'll see. Uh, this, I need to put this disclaimer in. I have no professional <laughs> kind of relationship with the financial world or it's, it's all kind of, what I discover on my own. Um, yeah, do your own due diligence. So uh, the, I try to put numbers that are fairly up to date, but things change fast. So uh, some of the numbers might be a bit outdated, but the, the structure of which number is bigger than others, it should stay the same. And uh, yeah, the four of you who are here, if you have questions, this is more of a informal meeting, it's not a lecture. So if you guys have questions you wanna ask, as you guys see here, every slide deck hopefully will have references and please explore them. I try to put as many references as I can. Okay, so this is the preamble. We can just go ahead. Financial goals. And yeah, maybe some of you saw this last year. So when I think maybe after about, let's say five years after I graduated, uh, I started kind of thinking about, okay, what are my financial goals? What, what do I want to do <laughs> with the, whatever my income is? Um, and I uh, can't remember how I stumbled upon this, but there was uh, this blog by a guy called Mr. Uh, Money Mustache. And uh, he talked about early financial independence. And uh, he's a, he was a Canadian, I think that's in the software development. And this is kind of what I guess drew me to it. Um, but he was talking about how... Um, a lot of a lot of the benefits of having a financial independence is not that you don't need to work anymore. A lot of I think there's a lot of potential or benefits from working, but uh, being able to kind of focus on what interests you. And uh, yeah, whenever you want to take a holiday, you can take a holiday, or um, you know, I guess spend time with the people you find important in your life. Um, in today's world, I'm not sure if this is as easy as the journey he kind of traversed. Uh, I think it's it's gonna be more turbulent, but we'll, we'll see. So, okay, I, I, I went through some of the notes he put uh, in his blog post, and then I kind of derived my own uh, mathematic, like just spreadsheets, and you can, you'll see them down here. So I've tried to, again, this is Google spreadsheets. If you click on these links, hopefully it's gonna take you to the spreadsheet that I used. 
figure out things out. Uh, maybe there's a problem. I, I, you can double check the math. <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't make too many mistakes. The idea with the with early financial determinant and why you can do it is. Uh, predicating on this idea of exponential growth. And hopefully, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you know about this, but in exponential, our minds are not meant to think exponentially. And we, we constantly underestimate how fast things grow exponentially. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a kind of an description of how fast some amount of money grows, depending on how much time you, you, you keep it in, in whatever financial investment vehicles you have. Um, so after 10 years, they grow two times, 20 years, four times, 30 years, 10 times and whatnot. The interesting part here is that the money you save and invest early on is gonna make more uh, uh, interest than, so this is, this is the, if you invest money from the age of 25 to 35, that money, so that's kind of, if you invest $1,000 a year from 25 to 35, that money, the interest is going to make, it's going to make more interest than all the investments you make from 35 to 65. So in 10 years, you'll, you'll have more interest than in uh, 30 years of investments. The earlier you can save money and invest, uh, the, the easier it's going to be. It, in the beginning, it's going to be hard, but the, the progression is kind of, it starts hard and it goes easier and easier. If you, if you go at it the other way around, it will say, okay, I'm going to start saving later on in my life. It's going to be easier in the beginning, but then harder at the end. Um, and then uh, this is a rule I use a lot of time, a lot of times. So if you want to figure out what the doubling rate of an exponentially increasing function is, um, you, you take 17 and divide by whatever the interest rate is, and you get uh, kind of how how fast things grow. So take percent uh, if you divide that by 70, it's kind of about 70 divided by this. So it's nine years or something. You double your money. Um, so, okay, in, if you save money early, and I didn't do this, so I started a bit later. Uh, if you save money early, it's gonna be easier. Um, and then here I put an 8% return and how I chose that, uh, I looked at the, this is the S&P 500 and the S&P 500 uh, stands for the largest 500 traded uh, corporations in, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. So in the North American market, we'll talk about the different markets. And uh, so I, I, I pulled up the numbers uh, for from 1960 to, to 2020, kind of put a um, 10-year moving average on it and just calculated what the average return was uh, in the last 20 years. And it was 7.9%, so about 8%. Interestingly, so there's times here when the, the uh, intro or return on investment was fairly low, so almost 0%. So there's, there's caveats around everything. Um, some more plus that I, so when I looked at this, I was like, okay, so how much, how, how do these uh, exponential growths look like? And I, I, this is one scenario that I used. Uh, if you're a single learner and you start saving 30% of your of your income at age 23, and your income is $70,000, $78,000, I have no idea how ballpark uh, these numbers are, then you make about 8% on average per year on those savings. Um, how long do you have to save for? Uh, so if you start at 23, by age 42, your saving stash, that's what I call it, is going to reach about a million dollars, and you would have invested about half of it from your savings, from your income, and half of it would be kind of from uh, the investment interest. Um, and then on that one million dollar, you'd be making approximately 78,000. So an equivalent amount is you're making at 23 uh, from just from investment income. Uh, and at this point, I think you would be able to retire. So this is a single earner, single income. Um, if you have a partner, you can probably save faster. Um, and this was when I when I said, okay, can can you live off seventy eight thousand dollars a year uh, after tax? I was like, okay, sixty two thousand. And then you have you have to save thirty percent. You have to save twenty three thousand. Then you have to live off forty thousand dollars a year. Uh, if you're frugal, you might be able to do it. I have no idea how things work, but. Yeah, we'll see. And this is these are all uh, these these are kind of how fast your uh, this is what I call the stash grows. So your the money you save grows, and this is your income for different uh, growth for different uh, returns on your investment. So we'll see here if you're getting a twelve percent return on investment, which was actually fairly interesting in the last well up to now twenty twenty it was about twelve percent in the per year. Um, you'll you'll be able to. You start about 23, 
you'll be making a million dollars by probably 36 at this on this curve we're on the red curve here in my example at eight percent so by age 42 you'll be kind of around a million and the million dollars nowadays unfortunately is not that much money <laughs> it's uh it's interesting i i might talk about that at some point uh so this was an example kind of just ballpark numbers and this is i i kind of went through mr money mustache blog and i i kind of perused all the, the blog posts or most of the blog posts he made and tried to come up with a history of his early retirement journey. And so he, he started saving in back in the old days, I guess when, before you guys were born. Um, and um, he was in the beginning, he was a single earner. Then his wife started, um, come on in, come on in. His wife, his wife uh, started uh, making some money and then uh, for them, I think it was a uh, they they uh, the the house they bought. This is this is unheard of. Um, was two hundred thousand dollars. So that's that's uh, and, uh, yeah, you can't do it here. Um, and that that was kind of uh, they then had more properties they bought and but it wasn't most of the money. I think they made it on the stock market uh, by investing in the stock market. Um, as you can see, their annual expenses were very low. I think Mr. Money Mustache was biking everywhere. He was uh, kind of had his own veggie garden and whatnot. He was trying to be as frugal as possible. And I think back in those days, living in Colorado, uh, this is probably not a high cost of living neighborhood. So he was able to uh, retire in nine years. And interestingly, I, I don't put, I didn't put it here, but in 2008, the market crashed. I think it went down quite a bit. Um, he was able to kind of, to just um, fare through that storm, and uh, he, I don't I don't think he ever went back to work. So and now I, his his stash is probably much larger, probably four times his. He had a million dollars, so much more. He's he's got some other business on the side. You can see you can see his history here. Yes. So he just worked for nine years and he's done. Yeah. Wow. So he so he worked well. He he worked for nine years, and you can see how his income, for example. The, the income here is in blue. This, I project on this axis here. Um, he was making quite a bit of money. So when he retired, he was making uh, between him and his wife, they were making about two hundred thousand dollars a year. But then they were like, okay, we no longer need to make that much money. Then this 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 is in green is their stash, the savings that kind of kept going up. And as your savings keep going up, it's very strange. But is the more money you make, so the more money you save, the more money you make. And in the beginning, you can't see that. But after a while, it's it's like, well, I haven't done anything. There's quite a bit of income that I am getting. Um, yeah. So this is this was their journey. Uh, fairly interesting that they were able to do it so fast. And also, I think Grace, it was gracious of them to put all this information out there. And people can go and uh, look at it. Um, so kind of some, some I'm trying to come up with rules of thumbs on how to, on, on how to can how I think about these things, and uh, so the, there's some assumptions here on return uh, early financial independence. So you can idea is the minimum return on investment you can have is about five percent. I think this is doable. We'll see. It, it's always the market. You never know what the heck is going to happen. Uh, and the, the other idea was you you can uh, live off about four percent of what uh, what. The, the the stash you have so how much money you save and if you look at and you want you want to not eat into your savings you want to live off more than uh, on less than your your interest uh, is going to make and if you look at this number two and three uh, if you live off four percent of your stash then your stash needs to be about 25 times your annual expenditures so if you spend uh, i know uh, let's say I, if you spend hundred thousand dollars, which is, I think, that's a lot of money, <laughs> you have to have about two point five million dollars saved. If you spend less, if you, yeah, so this is this is the a very easy rule of thumb. Most often, you'll probably spend about fifty thousand dollars. I don't know. That's so you probably need to save about one point two million dollars. Um, the the other thing here is the the more you save in terms of percentages. The less it takes you to reach financial independence. So if you save about 70% of take home income, you need to save only for 8.5 years before you can become independent. 
Um, we'll, we'll talk a bit about this later. Um, I also looked at, because I was just going through the numbers, I looked at the, this was, I think, from 2020, uh, the overall Canada, Canadian average income. And how does, can, can everybody kind of reach some sort of financial independence at some point? And it's interesting, this kind of, uh, I, I broke it down kind of, well, in the data, it was broken down by men and women, and um, women were making less. Then I took kind of the, how much money, the average woman, and this is not a woman in engineering, this is the average income for woman in Canada makes. Um, and I looked at different age brackets uh, and they uh, I used all this data, you can go through it here. And it turned out that if the, these previous assumptions are hold, uh, by age 65, uh, someone who's making average income in Canada and saves about 10% of their income per year can retire with about a million dollars. This is kind of on top of whatever old age security and pension uh, income you would have. And I don't think 10% is, I mean, you are making less, uh, but it's, it, it's, I think it's doable. It might be doable. I actually can't tell. I'm not in that position, but I was just curious how far can this particular scenario usage, use case go? And it seems like it, it can work for other people too. Okay, so this is kind of the goal. This is my goal. I don't know if your goal aligns to this, but this was kind of how I was thinking about things. And then uh, this is uh, the, the one, the, the students who've gone through 459, 479 know how much we love system level diagrams. Um, this was a system level diagram I put together for um, my wife's uh, siblings when they were in high school. And I'm trying to explain how I think about the money. and. At the bottom here, you have some type of income, either income from a job, what they call active income or income from investments, which they call passive income. You pay some taxes on it. Then you have some, some spending that you will use that money on. And then most of it, or hopefully is gonna, it can go in different types of investment vehicles. And we'll, we'll go through some of those. So the first part is we're, I'm just gonna briefly touch on wing income. There's, I can't really say too much on it because um, I, don't, I don't have experience. I haven't worked in many different uh, jobs, but uh, you can probably take a look at uh, that uh, Stanford course. And uh, the, I think the slides they have are much more in depth uh, on that. Um, I kind of broke it down into the same way they did, broke it down into four different types of jobs. And, uh, I, yeah, I don't know, you probably, some of you will go to grad school, so you'll forego some of this early income. Um, others might not go to this, this big. Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting because um, as a physician, I think if you, instead of going to med school in let's say 2008, you actually just started working in some other job and let's say you invested in the real estate market, you would have made more money uh, in the long, in like the last 20 years or 10 years, sorry, then you would have made kind of as a physician, like physicians now, even high paid jobs, I guess, depending on how the market works, you are foregoing some opportunities by educating yourself more. I have, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll talk about this in the second part so tomorrow. Uh, for now, it's, it's kind of fairly um, straightforward. So a lot of, one thing I'm going to say about, let's say these, uh, these Google type, Facebook type of companies, um, I don't know how many of you would, are going to go work for them. They have an interesting uh, incentive structure. So what they do is they, when, when they sign you up, they give you uh, this uh, signing bonus. Well, it's not only signing bonus. You, you have almost like a vesting schedule. And we'll talk about what vesting means. So they'll give you shares in the corporation, in the company. And uh, the way they give you the shares is they'll give you 50% of the shares in the first year. Or I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are, but they'll give you more shares in the beginning and less shares towards the end. So after four years, you actually get no annual bonus. So when they sign you up the first year, be like, oh, somebody asked how much money are they paying? You'll be like, oh, they're paying me $300,000 a year. And then that's not actually uh, reflective of how much money you're going to make in the long term because the first year they'll pay you $300,000. The next year they'll pay you $250,000. So by the time you're like 50 or in, if you haven't actually switched jobs in that particular structure, they'll pay you $150,000 a year. So there, there's a, this incentive either to move through the, the 
kind of the job structure you go start at engineer class one then go hopefully to engineer class six you either move to that ladder or you move to another company i don't think they want you to kind of stay in the same job position so it's an interesting observation um so yeah they'll, 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 most of the money i think if you look at base compensation versus equity here it's on par kind of so you make about uh the same amount in in bonuses or equity uh vesting so we'll talk about that as you make on your base salary um these these yeah the instagram so this is kind of a strange business here so you might get lucky working some sort of startup that makes it big um or next big thing is kind of the same thing but these these ones are a bit more established um yeah, I don't know how it works exactly well. The, the banks, I think, pay you very large bonuses that are uh, predicated on how much money you make for them. So this this actually can go, uh, the bonus can be significantly more than this, it depends on where you work, I think. Um, and I think there's, there's some students here who are working for banks, so they probably know more about this than I do. I'm looking at the, um, oh, uh, just a sec, Alex, oh shoot. Uh, David, do you mind if you go to the front door? That's me. Oh, that was I'm you? Here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so, okay. The, um, in the banks, I think it, you can make quite a bit of money, and depending on where you work, it runs in or not. It's an uh, outrageous month. Um, with, with kind of starting your own business, you actually pay, get paid very, very little. Most of your, or this is my experience, most of the compensation is going to be based on equity. Um, but with the equity, you'll be able to make quite a bit of money. So we'll, we'll see. So this is all I want to say about income from companies. I have in the appendix of these slides, some of my thoughts on startups. Um, I can go over that a bit if, if time permits, but we'll see. Okay, this is probably more important. Um, so we are at this, I, I kind of skip tax. I'll talk about tax in a bit. I'm talking, I'm going to talk about spending and budgeting. I think this is the hardest and kind of the most important part of, uh, managing your personal finances. Um, and the, the, the takeaway here is, depending on how well you can manage them, you can, you can be much better off than uh, people who make more money than you. So um, I think there's a lot of um, variance on this. So there's, yeah, there's, you, can, you can spend way out of your league and then um, you live fairly well, but it's always kind of you live in, you live on the expense on the back of you in the future. Um, what I've done a lot, I've uh, tried to track my expenses as carefully as I can. There's a, I'm, I'm using Excel, <laughs> so I'm kind of old school, but there's, there's all kinds of different apps you can use. Um, there's apps that you are, you can pair with your bank account. I think Mint is one of them and they will by default monitor how you, um, spend your money in different categories. So it'd be like groceries or travel or whatnot. And they'll provide a summary, I guess, whenever you want, and you can understand your spending habits better. Um, so with monitoring spending is one part. The other part is um, trying to come up with uh, how you actually, or having a budget. So saying, okay, I'm gonna be disciplined about how I spend my money. And I don't know how many of you make, make budgets, uh, and when, when you think about how you're planning your, your financial situation. So this is, this is a budget that I put together just quickly. You can access it down here if you want to take a, modify the numbers. Um, so this is, I think, an income, let's say two person income, $10,000 a month after taxes, you get about $6,000 and, or $7,000. Then the, 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 this amount kind of gets distributed in, in different classes. Uh, I don't know. Cars are probably this amount of money for gas is uh, severely underrepresented here in today's world. Um, I think so. Mortgage or rent here, that's this might be okayish. I don't know, um, depending on yeah, how, if you can live in a small apartment or not. But um, you can see kind of the distribution here. So most most of the amount you spend is kind of on housing, and then. I guess the, these are the ones that are fairly well balanced between each other. Uh, if you have a budget, this is going to allow you to um, have some certain, or hopefully, well, there's there's no certainty in this, but it's going to give you a bit more confidence about your future. And I think it's it's very important to to have one. So, uh, and yeah, the other thing I and I didn't put in is if you have kids, 
this is going to really modify things a lot. And the bit, I mean, you guys are young and you're not thinking about this, but um, that's also something in, it, it, I don't know, when you're 30 or something, or you'll, you'll, it's going to come to mind. And if you can adjust for that kind of early on, it's, uh, it's going to make life easier. Um, okay, so the, the, I, uh, my take, big takeaway here is that if you, have, if you set up a budget and monitor your spending, having a high saving rate is going to really uh, be better than having a high income. And uh, if you have to, to achieve your goal, or what the goal I had was uh, you know, financial independence. So it allows you to have less, you will need to save less. And also if you have a high saving rate, the money you make early on is going to work for you much more. Or you'll have more leverage with that money than um, later on. And this is, this is kind of an interesting human cognitive bias when we try to solve a problem, this is a puzzle that I saw was try to make this picture look symmetric. And most of the, and I, I did this, um, most of the way we solve this puzzle is we just add four uh, green dots in the corner here. Uh, but the, I, every time I think about this, I'm like, okay, if I have a problem, I could buy something that solves the problem, or is there a way in which I don't need to buy anything? I'm, I'm trying to declutter my life, remove something from my life that takes away that problem. And, uh, <laughs> This is kind of what the Lao Tzu, the, the guy who wrote the, uh, I think he wrote the Art of War. He said uh, to attain wisdom, remove things from every, every day instead of adding things. Um, so yeah, my, my guidelines here were uh, have a budget and track your expenses. And then if you have a financial goal, hopefully that's gonna give you a, 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 a driving function so you know what you're trying to get to. And I, I, I definitely suffer from this. As soon as I graduated, I had this lifestyle inflation. I bought all kinds of things. Um, and looking back at it, so I, I'm a bit of a data nerd. I have everything I buy, I actually put it in a list and then I can look at, and I have thousands of entries in this list. And I have, for any product, I, I take pictures of all the booklets and now I have all these booklets on all kinds of stuff. I have many, many types of different, um, items and looking back at them like well i didn't really need to do that um i could have saved that money earlier and uh in the end i would have been better off so yeah um the way i think you if you if you set up kind of some some accounts here for some some short-term goals um if i think the rule of thumb is to try to have some uh, cash available to allow you to live off between three and six months uh, I think six months is gonna make you feel better, uh, kind of more certainty. And then, yeah, just have have account uh, as you when you look at your accounts, say, uh, bucket them so that you have a certain goal that you're working towards. Um, I don't know if you want to buy a car. I don't know if that's a good idea nowadays. Um, so yeah, some long-term goals, and we'll, we'll talk about how we can use those. At, I have this home purchase. Children, I think, are a really good idea to think about early on. Um, it's, it's very, um, the system is not set up so that it rewards uh, raising children and that's gonna be strange. And um, I am gonna get, go a bit of an tangent here. So I looked, this is specifically at the physicians and I, uh, so my, my significant other, my wife is a physician. And then when we, got, when we went through school and then I decided, okay, do we want to stay in Vancouver? Or do we want to move out? And because uh, she, she would make way more money uh, in remote locations. And I, I kind of downloaded a lot of data off the web. So I did some web um, scraping where I went through different databases that British Columbia has access. And I looked at the income for physicians uh, around the province. Uh, and you, can, you could see what type of uh, physician they were and if they were a woman or, they, or a man. And interestingly, uh, women were making significantly less than men. Uh, and this was strange because um, as a physician, you get paid per um, activity. So if you, if you have some sort of operation that you do, you get the, you pay the exact same amount as a man or a woman. It doesn't, the, the system, whoever, uh, however many of interventions you make, that's proportional to how much money you get paid. And from, and when I looked at it and I talked to some other friends I had that, let's say both of them were physicians and I asked them, okay, who's making more? The man always made more because if you have children, 
again, the system is not made to uh, reward that. A lot of times the women kind of end up taking care of the children. Even it's, it's a strange situation on how the Western financial system evolved or over the last, I don't know, 200, 300 years. So thinking early about how you structure these things is I think important. Um, so yeah, the long-term goals, children or financial independence or not. So, okay, I'm gonna go back to taxes. So by looking at this budget, um, I plotted each category in, and we have this kind of plot. So total debt repayment, that was kind of housing. And then, but the biggest, the biggest class of expenses, if you make you know, some amount of money, it was, uh, was paying taxes. So the rich, so people who make, I don't know, millions of dollars or a year or more, or the, I think if you make more than $200,000 a year, probably rich, um, they are very good at minimizing the taxes they pay. So um, you can, it's called tax deferral, I guess, in a way. So it, you can, tax avoidance is illegal, uh, but you can structure your finances in such a way that you pay uh, as little tax as possible. And um, this is this is this particular group here. Oh man, I realize this, these uh, numbers are, uh, the font is small, so sorry about that. Um, these numbers actually changed quite a bit, uh, and I think they changed for 2022. So you guys should, if you want to know exactly the numbers, you'll probably have to go check on them. Uh, but the, 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 in the Western society, taxes, and I think on almost all countries, taxes are paid uh, differently depending on the income bracket you fall into. And uh, the, the way it kind of works is, um, so in BC, you have to take into account the provincial and the federal taxes. So the maximum, if you make more than, uh, I guess, $222,000 a year, you would pay a combined tax uh, rate of about 53% on your income. Um, but the, the, that's only on the income that's more than $222,000. On income that's less than $222,000, you would have to look at uh, these different brackets. So if you are between 222,000 um, and 159,000, you'd pay only 16% on that, um, that that amount falls in this bracket. Um, and then you kind of have to look at the federal income bracket in a different way. So the it's not exactly straightforward how much money you'd have to pay in, in taxes. You would have to kind of look at each bracket and on that bracket, get 15% of the 49,000 and kind of in between 49,000 and 90,000, 21% on that particular amount. Um, if, yeah, I might put a spreadsheet together where you can just type in the number and it's gonna give you the taxes, but uh, you have to take and keep that in mind. Um, the other thing is when you pay uh, taxes, I remember in this plot here, you pay taxes kind of on, on your income, but this income is the, the government uh, takes into account how you make this, uh, how this net income is achieved. So the active income is being taxed the highest, the passive income is being taxed the lowest. So uh, for the active income, you can have a maximum tax rate of 53%, and this is the marginal tax rate. So if you make more than $220,000 a year, you would pay on the like, amount larger than that, 53%. On the investment income, the way it works is you only pay 50%, you only pay taxes on 50% of the amount of income you make. So if you were to make, let's say $400,000 a year, you would pay taxes only on half of that. So you only pay tax on $200,000. Um, and um, depending actually on how you, in what type of account, and we'll talk about these, you are making that income. And this is uh, income, let's say, in, in I, I call this kind of trading account, but then I talk about tax sheltered account. Depending on how you make that, where you make that income, you can actually pay 0% um, tax on that. Um, okay, so um, this is, again, I was trying to put together something that's easy for you guys to get a feel for how, how this works. So depending on where you invest your, in what type of account you invest your money, and we'll talk about these different accounts, you would, you would pay different taxes. There, uh, since TFSA was introduced in 2009, and it's a fairly new type of account, we'll, we'll talk about what it does. The interesting part, because it's a new type of account, the United States government, uh, so between Canada and uh, United States, there's all these tax and tax treaties, but TFSA is a new account and the US government doesn't recognize it as a tax sheltered account. And you, for uh, dividends, let's say if you make it, uh, income from dividends in a TFSA account, you would have to pay 15% tax uh, to the US government. 
Um, the RSP, on the other hand, it's a much older account, and it is recognized by the United States as a, as a tax shelter account, and you don't have to pay account, uh, in, in, um, taxes on it. Real estate, depending on whether this is your primary residence or not, you'd pay um, uh, taxes on it when you sell it. Um, if it's not your primary residence, you'd pay half, and actually this number should be 27% on, uh, on whatever profits you make. And then trading accounts is similar. And then in your savings account, so if you have a savings account in, in your bank and it's not a new TFSA or RSP account, you would pay the maximum, in the worst case scenario, the maximum uh, tax rate. So I would, I would really um, try to persuade you not to put any money in your savings account and keep everything kind of either in TFSA or RSPs. Um, it's, it, you don't wanna give any well, kind of money to the tax, Taxman is if you can. So this is this is all legal. It's not 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 advising anything illegal. <laughs> and if you, if you think about it, in the end, it's kind of it allows you to allocate the money you you like. So if you want to give to charities, I think that's very important. It allows you to kind of select something that you you truly believe in. What do you uh, mean by a negative tax um, rate? Uh, sorry, what did I talk about negative? Oh, sorry. Uh, where's negative or? Uh, there are negative twenty seven. Oh no, it's about 20, approximate, wow. it's a tilde, approximately 27. Oh, sorry, so this is not negative 27. This is <laughs> approximately, the government won't pay you money. I mean, they do nowadays. We might talk, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, university basic income in the next lecture, in the next, in the next presentation. Uh, okay, so taxes, try to minimize taxes as much as you can. Or early on, it's going to pay kind of commence exponentially later on. Uh, okay, so now we'll talk about investments. I guess this is going to be the interesting part. Um, so I kind of mostly spend my time kind of researching investments in the, in the, in the stock market because the stock market reflects all types of different um, classes of investments. And uh, when, when I started, I actually had just check, checking and saving accounts. And then I opened a trading account before I had an RSP or TFSA account. Um, then I traded in there, which was not very tax efficient at all. Um, then the, the accounts you can have are, um, I try to list them here. Um, so these ones at the top are probably what most of you are accustomed to. Uh, they are not tax sheltered. And then you have different types of tax sheltered accounts. Uh, so this is uh, for individually, for yourself, you can have uh, retirement savings plans and tax-free savings account. Then I, for your, if you have children, you can actually put some money into these uh, RESP, so um, education uh, savings account that will be making money without uh, incurring a tax overhead. And again, kind of thinking in the long term, if you can strategize and plan things well, you can, you can set it up so that you don't pay too much, too, too much tax. Um, and for the trading accounts, there are many different trading accounts um, and they would be taxed as a capital gains tax. Uh, on, on the profits. The, the interesting part here is uh, you can actually, so if you're not a good trader, you can have losses and that's kind of what I had. And you get, uh, those losses actually get deducted. You can, you can subtract your losses from your income and then you pay less taxes, but you actually made less money. So it's not, it's a bit of a benefit, but it's in the overall, it's not a good thing. Um, okay, so uh, some ideas about RSP. So this is the Registered Retirement Savings Plan. This was, this came together a long time ago. I have no idea why this jumped up here. Uh, sorry, oh, disappeared. Um, the, the way you can use the RSP is not only to um, save money without being taxed, but you can use it to, uh, uh, when you purchase a house, you can use the savings in your RSP to put to you as a down payment to your house. And you have to pay them back in about 15 years. I'm not sure if this $35,000 is accurate nowadays. Uh, the government, I think, is, is going to increase it as prices go up and inflation kind of kicks in. Uh, I think this was last time I checked. Um, you can also use some of the RSP income, um, if you have any, uh, for your uh, education. So I don't know if you go to grad school, depending on what type of grad school you go. Sometimes you have to pay, sometimes you get paid. Hopefully you get paid. That, uh, the important idea with the RSP account is that you don't pay taxes when you put the money in. You only pay taxes when you take money out of the RSP account. So the uh, the interesting part is if you put money in your RSP account uh, on your income for that year, 
the money you put in your RSP account is going to be subtracted from that income. So you have to you pay less taxes that particular year when you put money into your RSP account than you would have paid if you didn't put money in your RSP account. And the amount of money you can put, I think I'll have to update this number, uh, is so it's 18% of your income for that year up to 27,000. I think this might have gone a bit higher than this um, for nowadays, we'll see. Um, TFSA is kind of, if you look at this diagram is the opposite way. So in the RSP, you pay taxes when you take money out of the account. In the TFSA, you pay taxes before you put the money into account. So, um, and after you put the money into account, whatever money you make in your TFSA, if you take it out of your account, you won't pay taxes on it. And uh, let's say you've grown your TFSA account from you were a very savvy investor and you grew it to up to a million dollars. Um, the if you take out that million dollars and you I don't know you purchase a lonely small apartment in downtown Vancouver, um, then you can put back another million dollars in your TFSA account. So the, whatever you take out, that contribution room stays. Uh, so the normally your contribution room is limited to a certain amount per year. And this is from 2009, it was $5,000. It, it does the, these contribution rooms change depending on who was in power and what they were trying to incentivizing the people who are voting for them. Um, but right now it's about $6,000 a year, but I think uh, at some point it was $10,000 a year. You can look, you can look through these uh, references here. Um, I think also with, with TFSA, you can only start putting money in your TFSA account when you reach, yeah, here, an age of 18 and not early, sooner than that. Um, just a, a kind of a side note, um, I don't know how many of you know about Peter Thiel. He's, a, he's one of these very rich um, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and in, in uh, as I say here, in the United States, you go, I, a lot of you, I think, will go to the United States to work. There's an equivalent called the Roth IRA 401k account. I think just to prove that um, I, I, he's got a beef with the government, I think he's got $5 billion in his TFSA equivalent um, account. So he, when he was investing in companies, he was investing them, investing them through his TFSA. He's just saying like, look, I can take out $5 billion without paying any tax on it um, because of this type of account. There's just a kind of a interesting side note. Um, so when, when you set up these accounts, so you can have different types of accounts, the trading accounts, uh, I, I think, Every major bank now has a type of trading account that you can use. I, I'm, I use TD, so I can kind of go with web broker, but each one of them has different trading accounts. Uh, they, they are not part of the standard banking account. I think you have to talk to some different arm of that of the bank. Um, and most often what happened, if you look at the history, these banks, the major banks just acquired the brokerage. Uh, and I think this was called TD Waterhouse because they acquired some companies that was called a brokerage company that was called Waterhouse and Scotia I traded with Scotia McLeod because I think they were they acquired somebody else. Nowadays, I think more people know about Robinhood, so this is uh, uh, it's easier to trade in there. Um, you can also have your own broker, broker, and you have I know some people who have them. The in the long term, I don't know if it's a if it's any benefit. The Robinhood, I. Think has minimal trading costs, but unless you trade a lot, I don't think there's a major advantage. And I would really discourage you from trading a lot. I don't know if you're, I, yeah, it's a, you get burned fairly easily and you soon learn that Mark is fairly smart. Does this include it, platforms sure. like Quest Trade? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think I'm going to go talk about them here. Yes, yeah, sorry, there was somebody on Zoom. Um. Media, are you there? It's, it's Dylan. I just joined. Hey, Dylan. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Do, do you talk at all about biasing towards TFSA contribution instead of RSP contribution while you're young and your income is lower? Uh, no, but that, that's actually an interesting point. Yeah, so um, I, I can, yeah, I'll, I'll, make, I'll have that talk and I actually see the exact opposite, but I, there's a lot of uh, different opinions there. But I think, Dylan, yeah, that's a fair point. I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll have a note on that. So, yeah, this is. Um, some other type of brokerage account. So then I'll, we'll, I'll mention that in a few slides. Um, there's, there's all kinds of brokerage accounts out there. And I think the, the more decent ones are, um, what they call them, the robot traders, where you'll, you'll put some money into the brokerage account and you'll specify a risk profile. Uh, and then there's these uh, more or less kind of automatic traders, automatic. This is just an algorithm that's going to invest according to your profile. And it's going to 
your risk profile and it's going to balance your uh, assets that you're invested in so that they constantly stay within that risk profile. So let's say um, you want to say, okay, I want to have fairly safe investments and uh, I want that to be about 80% of my portfolio. Maybe your fairly safe investment is designated Apple stock or something. And all of a sudden the Apple stock goes uh, through the roof and now 99% of your portfolio is Apple stock because the Apple stock increased a lot of price. Uh, the automatic, the robot trader is going to sell Apple stock so that it brings down the risk profile to 80% kind of safe investments. And it's going to uh, buy, uh, let's say, investments that are risky. So maybe 20% is going to invest in, I don't know, Tesla or something, you know, something more riskier. Um, so these are different types of account of trading accounts. I am fairly, um, I don't do much. I kind of let it run on autopilot. So I just use that uh, TD Waterhouse account and I, I mostly invest in index funds and we'll, I'll talk about this. Um, the, actually, I don't have a link to this, but there's a, there's a really good website called the Couch Potato. It's a Canadian uh, forum on uh, personal finance. And there you'll, you'll see all kinds of different uh, approaches and ideas about how to invest uh, your money in Canada. They also talk, I think there's, if you work in the United States, you want to transfer some uh, money into Canadian accounts. There's all kinds of um, strategies on how you can minimize your foreign exchange um, transfers uh, uh, fees. Okay, um, so what can you trade in those accounts? And this is kind of a list of if you if you stay with, let's say, invest in a stock market. Uh, so you can buy shares in in companies uh, uh, that are public. Um, and there's shares on the, that are mostly listed on the uh, Canadian and US exchanges. Uh, I don't know about all of these accounts. I know with TD, you can buy uh, shares that are not traded in, uh, in the North American market. So you can buy shares in Korea or Japan or the European Union. Um, I don't know if all of them allow you to do that. The, the fees are larger, so are higher fees. And uh, depending on what you buy, uh, there, there's some tax implications on that. Um, you can buy, uh, what mutual funds or exchange trading funds. So these are um, vehicles, investment vehicles that allow you to purchase kind of a, a, a basket of stock. So you can, we'll, we'll talk a bit about this. So you, instead of buying a single share, let's say in Apple, you want to buy a share of something that's spread across Apple, Microsoft, Google, and you can, you can talk about, okay, do I want to invest in IT? Do I want to invest in healthcare? What type of investments do I want to make? Mutual funds are uh, managed by uh, active investors. Yeah, I think in index funds and ETFs, I think are uh, more running kind of on autopilot. And because they're on autopilot, their fees are lower. And we'll talk about that. You can also buy bonds. And this is, um, it's unfortunate I can't show you, but you can say, okay, uh, there's bonds issued by government. There's bonds issued by uh, companies. And bonds are, uh, their investment vehicle that um, you, you purchase the bond and the bond is gonna have a maturity date. And at that maturity date, there's many types of different bonds. So when, when the bond is matured, it's gonna pay you back whatever you purchased it for, plus some interest that is explicitly called out. Um, and these are bonds in, as I said, the kind of government bonds, they're company bonds and also city bonds. You can go and see, okay, the municipality of Toronto is issuing some bonds and this is their return rate on those bonds. And unless the municipality of Toronto goes bankrupt, uh, and even if it goes back rather, I think you have um, some, some the, through the, there's, when it's something goes back up, it's a very complicated, but there's a judicial process and you might get some money back. Um, there's also, uh, you can buy GIC. So this is government insured uh, type of investments. Um, and by government insured, there's, there's, I haven't talked about that, but um, in Canada is in any uh, a savings account that you put money in, the government will insure that um, that investment that you put in up to $100,000. And uh, everything above $100,000 is not gonna be, if, if the bank goes bankrupt, and I don't know how many banks went bankrupt in Canada in the last I don't know, half a century, but if the bank goes bankrupt, you would lose that money. Up to $100,000, the government's gonna pay you back. Um, also you can buy, I don't know how many of you are on Wall Street bets, <laughs> on, uh, but you can, unless um, like you can do it on Robinhood, but you can also do it on these accounts. You can you can uh, you can buy and sell kind of short uh, stock, and you can also buy sell options. The other interesting part is here you can have 
if you, if you own uh, shares in a particular company, you can put it out um, kind of for short selling and you get some percentage of that price and that at some point you get it back. So you allow others to short sell it on your behalf in a way. Uh, and you can also buy IPO shares and you can get to get, you can, you can get burnt with IPO shares fairly easily if you think, but you can, you can do it through these uh, trading accounts. And depending on what type of trading account you uh, use, You'll, you'll have, I think what I like a lot about TD uh, Waterhouse is that they have a lot of research tools. So not only can you buy shares, but you have a lot of, you have access to fairly well structured um, annual reports. There's a, there's a company called Morningstar that provides you know, analysis on, on how companies are performing and you have access to those tools. They also have yeah, all these webinars on investment and whatnot. Um, I don't know how much Robinhood has on that i yeah um so the way i look at things is i i use etfs for long-term investments and i use gic's for short-term investments and short-term for me means kind of between 10 to 5 years and then long term is kind of five years plus um and if i really want to gamble instead of buying a lottery ticket i guess i buy a few uh individual stocks in in uh, in specific companies i think are going to do well uh, so the, the idea with ETF, so long-term investment, I, I normally buy, and I think this has been kind of the um, overall advice that I've heard from many, a lot of other people is buy index funds. And index funds allow you to, uh, in, to buy a, a kind of a, an entire stock uh, sector. And you, you can see here kind of some different types. And it's not only stock sectors. You can buy index funds in different types of, the, the way that stock is being traded is kind of one way you can use it. So for, for sectors, there's a list here um, on, on kind of what different sectors are. You can also buy index funds that are, let's say um, they go up uh, when the market is more volatile. Uh, so, or they, they, they correlate to different characteristics of the market. Um, and to me, they are interesting, but uh, I just kind of, in my, experience buying the overall market is the safest bet and you don't have to monitor anything you, you kind of just when your income you have your income coming in you just take a certain percentage of that buy some stock into an buy a share in an index fund and you just kind of go on autopilot you don't you don't think much about it i think in the beginning a lot of you might be interested in trying certain different strategies uh yeah i think that's a very good learning opportunity uh, so, uh, I, and yeah, I don't know. So I've done it, so I don't know. I can't advise you not to do it. So, but at the end, I kind of ended up doing this. Um, the, there's two big classes of index funds or index corporations that have are selling index funds. It's Vanguard and iShare, iShares. The, I, I use Vanguard mostly. I think that the guy who invested in, in sorry, um, created index funds, uh, can't remember his first name. John Bugle, I think, is his John is his first name. Uh, he created this Vanguard fund in 1975. This was he was way ahead of his time. Uh, and the the Vanguard fund, I think, if you are employed in the Vanguard fund, uh, the, you have to invest a certain percentage of your assets in the funds themselves. Uh, and they are they are very. Uh, in, because of that, they have skin in the game. So it's to me, it's kind of a if, the, if things fail, those guys are also going to get hurt. So I, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but yeah, that's, that's a one way I look at it. Um, the, the other thing when I look at index funds is I look at this management expense ratio. Uh, depending on what type of fund you invest in, uh, you would have to pay a percentage of your uh, of your value every year to the fund managers for for these automatic types of index funds. You pay a very very low percentage. And I think it, again, taxes and these management expense ratios types of expenses are, it's very important to keep them as low as possible. Um, and I'll, I'll show you an example here. So this is, uh, which one is this one? This is uh, an index fund that's investing in the S&P 500. So this is the 500 largest companies in the United States. And this is a prospect that you can look at. And this fund has, a, it's managing $4.3 billion um, in assets. and. The, the funds themselves, they grow because the market grows, but they also, they'll pay you a dividend. So every year they'll pay you 
it's actually every quarter that'll pay you dividends that amount to 1.2% for this particular fund per year. And depending on the type of index fund you choose, this dividend might be higher or lower. So for example, I know in utilities, so this is if you buy uh, an index fund that invests in companies that uh, produce electricity or move electricity around or move uh, methane gas or utilities, so that those guys pay a higher dividend per year. So they pay, I think, 2 to 3% a year. Uh, the, the big one is here. So this is the management expense ratio. So you pay 0.08% 0 .08, 0 .08, 0 .08 per year in expense ratios. So whenever I look at a, a prospect, I kind of, the first thing I look at is how much money am I paying uh, to, to have access to this fund? Uh, so that's that. Now for the S&P 500, I, when like, the next thing I kind of look at, if I look at these index funds is what do they, what's their, um, how is their allocation of uh, funds uh, spread out across the different companies. And in the last probably 10 years, uh, you can see that there's a fairly heavy top, like IT heavy allocation uh, where most of the big companies that this, this particular funds invest in are, are related to uh, IT. And this is reflecting the actual market. So the market cap, so the total value of all the stock in the uh, New York stock on the New York Stock Exchange uh, is mostly allocated to these different uh, these companies and we'll talk about this This is a fairly interesting property of a lot of different systems but it's a it's, um, the Pareto distribution where 80 percent of the value is uh, split across 20 percent of the the items in what, what, whatever class it is um, so yeah I look at this and I like okay so that's interesting so if I buy shares I wouldn't probably buy individual shares of Apple because the index fund that I own already has Apple. So I'm like, okay, if Apple goes up, the index fund is gonna account for that. I try to look for uh, potential investments that are not in these index funds. Uh, so, okay, this is, this is kind of a, for this particular S&P 500 index fund. So this is the ticker symbol. So when you buy shares, you'll, you'll this is, I guess, from the old days when you didn't have a lot of, uh, font space, a lot of text that you can write. Every every investment you buy has a, a short name for it, and that's called the ticker symbol. And for this particular index fund, the ticker symbol is VOO. So if you go to um, I don't know Yahoo Finance here and you just type VOO in their search, it's going to bring up this particular index fund, and it, you can see how it performed uh, in across different decades. Um, and then here down here you can see when they are paying dividends. So every Every year they would pay kind of a dividend every three months, I guess. Um, and in blue is the index fund itself. And in pink is the, the S&P 500 market cap. And this is showing that the index fund tracks relatively well the S&P 500 overall. And this is depending on how, how well people are, the, the managers move in and out of the market, this tracking might get better or worse. Uh, I'm looking at, this is another index fund. This is the US to total stock market. Um, so similar to the S&P 500, uh, this is instead of just investing the top 500 companies, you're actually investing the entire US stock market. This is probably about 3,800 companies, oh, 3,500, I guess, companies. Um, at the top, they are fairly similar because the companies, uh, they, they are the ones who uh, account for most of the market. Uh, another one that I'd like to look at is everything except North America. So this is um, the whole world except, so this is VX, it's XUS. So without, when you don't have American companies in the fund, uh, how do they look? And uh, it, uh, just kind of monitoring this over the last 20 years or something like that, more 30 years, there's a, more and more companies are from coming from China and uh, kind of Asia. Before there were quite a few from Europe, but those are kind of uh, not growing as fast. Um, so if you invest in this particular uh, index fund, and this is traded on the American stock exchange, so you can buy it from the United States, but it will give you exposure to uh, non-American companies. And again, so you can you can see how the, this particular fund is distributed across different companies. Um, yeah, the, the, the market allocation, this is, these are just numbers I like to keep track of how things are moving around the world. Uh, China is, I think, coming in fairly hot, which is interesting. They, they have a lot of potential to grow. Um, the, the Europeans are kind of uh, falling behind. Um, 
I know, so this is, this is the, the stock market. With the stock market, you can actually purchase, if you are interested in real estate, you can buy real estate uh, index funds. So it, it's, you buy uh, shares in companies that invest in real estate, and through those, you can get exposed to real estate. But let's say you want to buy uh, real estate on your own. Um, one paper that I thought was really, really good, uh, and this is actually a paper that uh, when I saw that the CS007, the Stanford course referenced the same paper, I was like, okay, yeah, this guy's in the same wavelength as me. So this is a paper put together by the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, I think it was Deutsche Bank. So they analyzed the returns on uh, real equity, and this is kind of real estate and the stock market over about 150 years. So um, from 1870 to 2010. And then what they noticed was that depending on, it doesn't really matter if you invest in the stock market or real estate, the returns are more or less the same. Um, in the 1970s, the, the stock market actually had the marginally better returns than the real estate market. I think it totally depends on where in the world you live, uh, uh, depending on if you want to look at real estate. Uh, Vancouver is probably doing really, really well. I have no idea if this trend is going to continue. But uh, me, when I looked at this paper, I was like, okay, I'm not very interested in buying kind of real estate right now. Uh, when, well, so again, this is a decision you want to make on your own, but this is, this is a paper that I thought was interesting in, in capturing some of the differences in investing in real estate or the stock market. I am going to say that if you have, if you buy, purchase real estate, there's a, a significant cost in taxes you pay every year uh, on that real estate. So you have to be careful about that. And it, depending on if you buy kind of just land or a house, there's expenses associated with that. So uh, with, with a, the stock market is you kind of buy it and forget. And with the real estate, I think you have to manage it a bit. And I don't know how the, those costs are, are non-zero. Non, non so you have to take those into account. Um, then I, this is when, when I looked, when I was looking at the buying a property, the thing I was trying to keep track of is what is the, how is the interest rate looking? And the, you can go to the bank and ask, okay, what's your, a five-year mortgage interest rate, uh, but you can also look at the bond market. And the more bond market is uh, where, so when, when, you, when you get the mortgage from the bank, what the bank is gonna do is gonna package that mortgage with other mortgages from other people. They are gonna split it into different tranches, uh, different kind of segments. So depending on who made that mortgage, and then they're gonna sell it as bonds, as a uh, mortgage-backed as uh, securities. And those, so the, the returns that you'd make on as an investor in those mortgage uh, securities is uh, correlated with the bond market. And this is kind of how the bond market looks nowadays. I don't know if you, how many of you have heard that mortgage rates are increasing because inflation is coming around. Uh, but the the bond rate, the bond rates are going up. And this was the same plot, kind of looking over uh, 27 years. So the, the bond rates and the interest you would make on your saving account and you would pay for your mortgage in the last 27 years has been in this kind of decreasing trend. Uh, and it's almost reached 0% in, I think it was, well, yeah, it's now 2020, but it was also like in around 2015. So this means that you would have to pay less and less uh, interest on your, on your mortgage. I don't know if this trend is gonna stay low like this or if it's gonna go high. Uh, but in the last 27 years, I guess, if you were to purchase real estate because of this trend, I think you'd, uh, you'd come, be coming up ahead because they, there's also inflation that's not being taken into account here. So you'd uh, I don't know, have a mortgage that would pay, you would have to pay 3% interest, but then uh, let's say the inflation was maybe higher, 6 7%. So in the long term, you'd be paying less real money than the inf inflation adjusted money. So you'd probably in the real estate market in a way is benefiting a lot from this particular trend of decreasing interest rates. If it stays like this, it's, um, I mean, it can go much lower. So it can go below 0%, maybe. Um, uh, but if it, yeah, if it stays like this, you're probably, okay. If interest rates start increasing, the, the mortgages that people can take out are gonna become smaller. So uh, maybe prices, house prices are gonna change, I don't know. Um, there's other types of investments, and this is kind of a, this is how I started. Uh, I was doing what, what I call is fundamental analysis, where I was looking at, oh, this company, how well does it do? And I was looking at price to earning ratios, all kinds of ratios and whatnot, trying to 
infer how well the company is going to do. Um, and you can do, I think, a cache um, on some companies. Most often, you'll probably do very poorly. On average, I think you do you do poorly. Um, so there's two types of investments. Uh, when I started, I was looking at this fundamental analysis where I was evaluating each stock independently. Uh, and I, was, I made fun of this technical analysis approach where you look at trends. So you look at how the, the stock market prices look and you have all these different types of trends, the head and shoulders uh, trend where you have like this peak and then kind of decreases in prices. There's, there's all kinds of trend related analysis. Um, I made fun of it because I didn't really understand how it was working. Uh, I think uh, there were a lot of um, people who wouldn't understand how it was working and I read their blog posts. But later on, I realized that uh, if you really go deep into this and you trend on correlations between different asset types and whatnot, um, you can make a lot of money, uh, significantly more than um, if you use this fundamental analysis. And I give you this example here. I don't know how many of you have heard of Jim Simmons. Um, he was a mathematician. Um, so uh, he was working for NSA, I think in the 1950s. Uh, he has some sort of, uh, there was some some article he published, or maybe he he gave an interview against the Vietnam War, and then they uh, the NSA fired him, uh, and then he was like, you know what, I'm just gonna start my own investment uh, company, and uh, he was he just hired lots of mathematicians and the physicists, and they were just trending on trading on trends. They didn't really understand what they were doing, like what were the what was causing those trends, but they were trending on those. Trends trading on those trends. And the, the crazy, well, the most impressive part of it was uh, from nine, see, he had a few different funds. Um, all of them did really well, but the one that uh, it was for the insiders. So for the, for the people who worked on that fund, they also kind of pulled their money and invested with that fund too. Uh, and they made uh, from 1994, 2014, they're very secretive, secretive about this. So there's not a lot of information, but they made 71% uh, per year in, in, in those in 20 years, which is in, yeah unheard of. Um, so uh, similarly, you probably heard of uh, Warren Buffett. He's kind of the more um, an fundamental analysis type of character. So the prototypical fundamental analysis, he made 20% per year uh, from 1965 to 2021. And the S&P 500 was making 10% per year in, in kind of growth rate. Um, what I said here is, yeah, I, I I'm not smart enough, and I also don't have enough time to look into this uh, this type of trading. So I just invest mostly in index funds. Um, and then there's all kinds of other type of trading if you are interested in it. Nowadays, I think a lot of people are trading uh, crypto or foreign exchange. So in in different countries, I know that there's a lot of people just dabble into trading in foreign exchange, trying to make money that way. Option trading, so calls and but but um, probably know about that. Uh, different, yeah, all kinds of, I try to capture some of these different types of investments. Um, I think there's also an idea of trying to make evergreen content, so content that pays you. Um, so I, I, there's a lot of people nowadays, or not a lot, but a an interesting amount that uh, have YouTube tutorials, they make some invest, some returns from that. Amazon, I guess you can make some money off that if you gain it in a way. Um, there's all kinds of different types of investments. Um, this is, this is my philosophy why I kind of trade index funds. And I highly recommend watching this reference here, How the Economic Machine Works by Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio is another one of these uh, very successful investors. Um, and uh, the way it, this is captured from him, but uh, again, I was thinking the same way, uh, just from reading a lot of different books. The, mark, the, the value of our society grows uh, very slowly every year through mostly through technological progress. So the fact that we can build houses and build roads and uh, I don't know cure diseases and allow people to work more efficiently means that the overall value of the market is slowly increasing. Uh, the money that's kind of circulating through the market uh, is going to go in and out of the market. So sometimes you have more money in the market and that's going to make the price of the market look higher. Sometimes people are going to take their money out of the market and the market is going to look like it crashed. But the underlying value, unless you have some war or some massive destruction, earthquakes and whatnot, the underlying value, so those factories are still, and the production that they have associated with them is still there. 
And if the demand is, oh, there's there's something, we'll, we'll talk about this in the next lecture, in the next presentation, but the, if the, there's still demand for the products they sell, the fact that the, the people are moving money out of the market is not gonna impact a lot the underlying value. And you'll, you'll have these different trends, short-term fluctuations, long-term fluctuations uh, that are gonna make the market look kind of fairly random, but the underlying structure, if this holds, that the market is slowly, I think it's growing at a, at a much slow, at an exponential rate, uh, but it's, it's not gonna be as volatile as the market price. What I'm trying to do is by investing in, this is my strategy, by investing in the market and trying to ride this blue curve way, uh, path, but I'm investing kind of in the red path. So I'm, I'm, sometimes I might be over, I might be buying when the market is undervalued. Sometimes I'm gonna be buying when the market is overvalued, but I'm hoping overall, if, I'm, if you're slowly investing, you'll kind of ride this way. Um, dangers, this is an interesting one. When, when I think about it, and this is, I guess, when I'm, I, I'm not very comfort, confident in if this trend is going to continue. So first, I'm going to talk a bit about why I think I cannot beat the market. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different dimensions. I listed some of them here. I think there's, there's a lot to be said about you play against professionals, and there are a lot of smart people that dedicate like 24-7. They're a bit of, more than obsessed to this that you would have to invest in. in uh, against if it's a zero sum game. Um, yeah, the, these are kind of some of the points. I'm not gonna go through them. Uh, the biggest one is that I think uh, we are not rational. So we have a lot of biases in our cognition. And if we don't understand them well, they are gonna come back and bite us. Um, and we, this is an interesting one. We are predictably irrational. So we have biases that are irrational biases, but they are kind of fairly predictable. And I, there's definitely people who trade on these biases. So they already, they understand kind of how, how we think. And then based on that, they, they make some trades. And this, for example, uh, the, an interesting one is, um, this, was, this was in, the, remember the uh, Jim Simmons, this guy who made, who was making 71%. So back in probably the 1980s, they noticed that there was a correlation between the weather outside the New York Stock Exchange and the, the how, how uh, pessimistic uh, the traders were. That correlation, they took it out. So they made money off that. Uh, they, they, they've mined the patterns in the data to the nth degree. And if you come in, they, you're already kind of incorporating their trading strategy. They have all the, the, the I'll put a book at the end on, on kind of uh, a biography of Jim Simmons, which is interesting. Um, this is because you are irrational. This is, uh, and how many of you know that the, uh, Isaac Newton lost his uh, fortune in the, there was a bubble in the South. So uh, back in his days, there was a chartered corporation from the, US, the British government that was doing business across the, the, the globe. And the, the Newton invested in it. And he, you can see how, how, how kind of things are, you just invest on your hopes and dreams. And also kind of based on what your peers are doing. So. Newton kind of invested early, he made some money, but then he saw his, everybody around him was making more. So then he kind of went and invested some more. And then the, the, it's, it's a, one of these reflexive kind of positive feedback loops where the more people invest, the more it go, the, the higher it gets. And then at some point, everybody becomes scared. And it's like, oh, I'm gonna take my profits. And then the, the bubble bursts and everybody unfortunately kind of exits after the bubbles burst. So you're, you're losing your investment. Um, this is another trend here. So. In pink is the S&P 500, the value, the returns. And then um, it's the, in blue is when money kind of moved in and out of the market. So you can see, okay, when, when the S&P 500 peaked, people would move money in after the peak. So they would move money when the actual, when the, you, would, you would buy when the market is, uh, sorry, you would, you would yeah, you'd buy assets that are crashing in price uh, or you, instead of buying kind of on the up, upstream you buy on the downstream so you kind of lose money and you're this is it's kind of a lag so if you look at it as a, as a systems you know feedback loop uh, you're you're kind of lagging some information is lagging uh, and people who are investing early i guess if you are into this type of investment you'll make some money um another another interesting observation was uh, somebody was looking i think at different accounts and they're trying to identify 
who is making the most amount of money. And they observe there's a different, uh, there's a certain class of people who are making a lot of money. Uh, and they try to look, okay, who, who are these people? They, they figure out that these, the, the accounts that are making the most amount were accounts related uh, uh, for people who died. So it was accounts that were not going in and out of the market. They were just kind of staying the course. And this is, I guess, again, one of these idea of why you would invest in index funds. And another interesting uh, observation, I don't know if it's in these slides and, and these references, but uh, I think women actually make more in investment than men because men are much more, uh, they, they jump in and out, they, they try to make moves and whatnot. And I think women in general are a bit safer and they're like, okay, I'm gonna stay, stick with this and I'm gonna keep just riding the wave. Um, here, yeah, you can see there's, there's all kinds of types of people and kind of different, um, different returns they can get. And the, the index funds kind of, this is what I've experienced. Well, my experience you make in the last 20 years, you've made more than 7% a year, but um, somewhere, somewhere in here in this ballpark, you but make about 6% a year. Um, okay, some other, a big danger that I noticed, uh, this was, I think maybe 2014, I got a, a letter from um, one of these index funds saying that uh, in, in their prospect, they said that they have to stay diversified. So they need to invest in different companies as part of their, their regulations. And then they, in the letter, they said they can no longer uh, respect that particular regulation because there's not enough companies to invest in, in the stock market at large. And this is because a lot of, uh, it's, there's this coalescence of different comfort, big companies gonna buy all these other companies, the smaller companies, and everything is now under the same umbrella. When you go buy, purchase a particular product at the stock at the know, superstore, they have a different trade name, but they are owned by the same corporation. And here is kind of a, a from 1980s to I guess 2017, how many different companies are listed on the New York Stock Exchange? And this is gonna it's, it's slowly kind of going lower and lower and lower. And I think I got the letter, yeah, it was probably here when they went below 4,000. And they did, they did say that we can no longer support uh, stay at 4,000 or something like that to that effect. Um, because there's fewer and fewer companies, now the idea is if, if one of these big companies goes bankrupt, it's gonna impact the portfolio in a, in a big way. So I don't know, this is a danger. I don't know how things are gonna proceed from here, but that's, that's one thing. Another thing that I noticed, and this is, um, this is a, again, another thing. So if you stay diversified, it means that if you invest, let's say, in oil, hopefully if the oil market goes down or goes up, um, some other type of market is not going to go up or it's not going to be correlated to that. So invest, and this is, okay, buy a U.S. stock market, uh, and that hopefully is not, if the U.S. stock exchange crashes, if the U.S. stock market crashes, maybe the Chinese stock market is not going to crash. And this, this plot here is trying to show kind of the correlation between the different types of assets. And just a reminder of correlation of one means that things move in perfect unison. So when things go up, they all go up exactly the same. The correlation of minus one, it means that they move in different, it's exactly the opposite direction. When one goes up, the other one goes exactly the same amount down. Um, and you, you'll see trends here. So in green, it means that these type of uh, asset classes, so US stock, foreign stock, emerging markets, these are small, comp uh, small countries, uh, natural resources, real estate, these are all highly correlated. So it means that when the stock market goes up, the real estate also goes up more or less. Um, it used to be the case that bonds were inversely correlated with the, the stock market. And this was because people had a, uh, when the stock market would crash, you would fly, there was a flight to safety and bonds were considered safer options. So when the stock market crashed, everybody would buy bonds and the bond prices would kind of go up. Um, this was 2020, 2021. I took this picture, a screenshot last year. And interestingly, I took it again this year, and I have no idea what the heck is going on, uh, but everything has become more correlated. So it used to be that this might be an artifact of how that was analyzed, so a big grain of salt here. It used to be that people would fly, their flight to safety using bonds. It seems nowadays if the stock market crashes, people no longer buy bonds. It, it seems like there is a correlation of zero means there's no, there's neither a positive nor negative feedback. They, they, they train kind of randomly to each other. So it seems like the bond market all of a sudden is no longer correlated with the stock market. It's neither correlated positively nor negatively. I, I don't know what to make of it, but it's an, I thought it was an interesting observation that just a one year thing kind of changed a lot. So I guess when you look at these, don't look at them like, okay, this is gonna stay constant. These are dynamic systems, so they, they change a lot. 
Um, this is a big, big, a bit of a bigger picture. Um, the the way that the economies kind of of the world are progressing, uh, a lot of the, I would say maybe there's a, we will we'll talk about this in the next presentation. But a lot of times there was this idea of that the markets are fairly decoupled from how the governments work, and the government would allow the market to stay uh, live on its own. So if the market failed, the market the government would not step in and let companies go bankrupt. And this process of companies going bankrupt and kind of new ones coming around would result in a market that is efficient. Um, this is this is a book that I read, I guess, when I was 30 or something like that. Um, I think uh, when the Russian economy, or sorry, the, the USSR collapsed, there was this idea that the capitalist system has prevailed against the communist system and it's the best system in the world. And there was a transition, everybody tried to transition to a capitalist system in the, in the, on a global scale. Then certain things kind of starting a, a, an interesting turn. So between 1994, I think it was 1998, there were, uh, there were a lot of uh, governments in Asia that actually did really well. So these were the tigers, uh, I guess Singapore, Japan, Korea, also China, and there were little Philippines and Indonesia. These countries, um, they, the governments themselves went bankrupt. And I think a lot of them were, um, they, they loaned money from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and whatnot. And a lot of them were left to uh, just go bankrupt. And that caused, the idea was that, okay, you know what, Philippines is gonna go bankrupt, but it's gonna stay uh, just kind of within the Philippine neighborhood. That, that bankruptcy is not gonna propagate, it's not gonna be contagious. Uh, but it soon turned out that there is a lot of correlation that we don't, I don't think we understand exactly why. Maybe the investors, again, kind of think in a certain way and they, it's a hive mind. Uh, but so I think it started Philippines or Indonesia, I can't remember. It ended up with Korea. So uh, the Korean government, I think, uh, or Thailand. Yeah, sorry, somewhere. Sorry. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, and then the, what happened with Korea is the, the, the World Bank or one of these big organizations actually stepped in and gave them, I think it was back then, it was a huge loan of five billion dollars, and they rescued that uh, that particular kind of structure. Um, the next thing that happened was um, there was this com com or fund, long-term capital management, that was I think they had like two or three Nobel Prize winners that were investing kind of on again trend investing. So they're looking at different trends and trying to make money off arbitrage. So they buy something low in one side of the world and sell it high. And these guys had uh, exposure to Russia and Russia was considered, okay, these guys can't fail. Russia's a big nuclear weapons state. How the heck can they fail? And Russia actually did fail. So they went bankrupt. I think it was 98. And uh, long-term capital management was gonna go bankrupt themselves, but they had exposure. You can see how they had exposure to about a trillion dollars. And back then a trillion dollars was a lot of money. Uh, nowadays it's, You'll see it's fairly small. Uh, so, but the, the, because they had this huge exposure, everybody who was exposed to long-term capital management would have significant financial impact. And the Federal Reserve, which was the, the it's kind of the Bank of Canada equivalent in the United States, um, stepped in and just bailed out uh, this fund. And this was when a private fund, it was the first time in, that I know of, when a private fund was bailed out by, the, by a government. And the same thing happened again in 2008. Uh, somewhat of a similar kind of scenario played out in 2020 when the, the coronavirus kind of came, kicked in. But this is now, it, it means that the market itself, the, the idea that the market is efficient and the capitalist system is the, I, the best system in the world, it's kind of lost its appeal to me. It's, it's one of these things where it seems like we are, this is, you've probably heard this term, we are uh, privatizing the gains and kind of social, uh, 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 socializing. So the, the, any gains you make, the corporations make them, and then any losses that are made are going to go on the back of the kind of social structures of the government and the people at large. Um, when I look at this, I, I so for example, when, when uh, the Federal Reserve bailed out certain companies, what they do is they sell. Um, so nowadays, they, they, what they do is they, they have this process called quantitative easing. So they buy assets in the stock market to prevent the value of those assets to go down. And uh, this is kind of the balance sheet, I think, of the US Federal Reserve. So how much money they have invested in these assets. 
And I think until about 2008, you can see they were just below a trillion dollars in assets. So they, they buy and sell assets on the stock market to kind of keep things fairly level. In 2008, they, uh, there was an economic collapse and they started buying assets at a very rapid pace. So in, in I think it was a year, they bought a trillion dollars worth of assets. They continued this, this asset purchase program. So they, mean, they were trying to maintain the value of those of the stock market and the assets that are being traded on the stock market by purchasing more and more. So if, if individual, private individuals will not purchase them, the US Federal Reserve purchases them. Um, 2020, this was coronavirus. There was a recession. The US Federal Reserve immediately kicked in. This is interesting. So this was, uh, it's not only the US Federal Reserve, it's all, a lot of other banks around the world. Uh, so Bank of Canada, but I think more important is the European Central Bank and also the Chinese Central Bank. I guess those are big players. Uh, so this is what I was saying that $1 trillion is no longer a lot of money. So, and I think in one year, the US Federal Reserve bought $3 trillion worth of assets on the stock market, or not only the stock market, you know, at large, and they continue this purchase program. So the money that's available right now that's being traded on the stock market and whatnot, it's no longer reflecting. Remember that underlying curve that I was talking to you about, the, the blue curve, that's the value. So now there's more and more money coming into the market. So um, there's the, so the market value is, is overpriced now. So we are in a way, I, I don't know exactly how things work. This is my simple understanding. I'm trying to educate myself. There's this whole modern monitor theory uh, school of thought that uh, kind of sees these in a slightly different perspective. Um, but this is, this is kind of changing. And this to me is kind of fairly dangerous. I don't know how things are gonna progress, but we'll see. Um, this is the, the guy, John Bugle. He's the, the uh, Vanguard, the index fund uh, creator. Uh, he talks about this. I think he died a few years ago and he has a book, The Battle for the Soul of Capitalism. And he highlights this fact that it used to be that uh, corporations were run kind of by owners and the owners were very interested in the corporation growing kind of long-term. Now, a lot of corporations are being run by managers and managers kind of run on a quarterly basis. Um, the, the everything, the most of the decisions they make are in kind of short term and to make sure that uh, their profits are high because their compensation is directly proportional to the profits they make. And in the long term, this, this particular approach might not work well. Um, okay, summary, sorry, this is, hopefully I can finish on time. Um, this is kind of my insight. Uh, this book was, so uh, this book, I found it in my wife's uh, bookshelves. She didn't read it, but she bought it. And then I read it in, I think it was when we were second year or something like that, an undergrad. And then after I read this book, I was like, oh yeah, okay. So to make a lot of, if you're a savvy investor, it's very, very difficult. And there's a lot, there's a lot of people trying to be savvy investors. So the way to go is just uh, kind of invest in index funds that are trying to capture the, under, the growth in the underlying value of the market rather than uh, individual stocks. Um, a lot of times when you see people making a lot of profits, uh, you have to look at what's called the, the risk adjusted returns. So the, in, in kind of the simple perspective on that is they make a lot of profits because they take more risk or they leverage. So the, the leverage is like you, you borrow money from someone to buy a certain asset and then you pay them back the, the money you bought, you borrowed, but you, you take the, the difference as profit. That works well when you're making money. It works uh, really, really badly when you're losing money because you now have to pay. And, and it's, it's the same thing with the selling uh, shares short. Um, the, there is something to be said about index funds. Um, in the last, I guess, 10 years, there's a lot there's more than that. There's a lot of interest and a lot of investments in them. And right now, this is like $10 trillion in 2018 uh, was... Um, or I guess four trillion in index funds here was invested in the stock market through index funds. Um, this might be meaning that there's a, I don't know, there's fewer people that are doing the kind of careful analysis of corporations and how how much money should be invested in each. Um, and maybe it's kind of one of these kind of sheep. Everybody's like a sheep in a herd, and everybody's kind of moving the same way. 
uh, index, I'm still kind of fairly optimistic that index funds are the way to go. So again, the, the idea is you're trying to uh, capture that underlying trend in, in market in the market value growth. Um, the, the time in the market is more important than timing the market. I think this is a fairly well-known quip. Um, as far as I can tell, when I looked at mutual funds and other non-index type funds, it was hard to find something that uh, made it was positive across a, a long time horizon. Um, so yeah, and the other idea is try to minimize all these, uh, I guess I'll call them friction, um, the, the taxes, all kinds of trading fees. So if you trade often, uh, you pay a fee every time you trade. So the more trades you make, the more fees you pay. And then there's all these management expense ratios. So keep all those fairly low. Um, practical suggestions. And this is the, I guess, to your point, I'd say kind of something different than you, but I don't, yeah. Uh, I think your point is also valid. Uh, so be disciplined. I think this is the idea of budget. Make sure you uh, understand kind of your expense profile, expenses profile. Don't uh, inflate your expenses kind of just to feel good. Think, yeah, reward yourself first. So, and by, by reward yourself first, I mean reward your future self first. Uh, think about I yourself think in like 10 years. Hey, Midi, the, the the point about the the TFSA is like if you if you have like tons of money left over, you know, at the end of the year, then you can probably top up both. But like if you if you only have enough to contribute to one, then when you're first starting your career, you know, I don't know, maybe you're making an eighty thousand dollars a year or seventy or a hundred or something like that. Whereas ten years into your career, you might be making you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and you'll be in a much higher tax bracket. So if you prioritize contributing to your TFSA and you save up your RSP contribution room, then when you do start contributing to your RSP, you'll be uh, reducing your income when you're paying a much higher rate of taxes. So if you I, only do one, they say, when you're younger and you anticipate earning more in the future, start by contributing and making sure you top up your TFSA first. I'm not sure if there's counter arguments to that, but that was my understanding of it. I, th I think you're right. Um, when I, I realized the way I do it as I top both of them and the way I, why I was saying you have TFSA, RSP first was if you get your RSP for, and yeah, so I think Dylan, you're right. If you can top only one, probably a good idea to early on in your career, top TFSA first because um, the RSP, so remember those, those marginal tax rates all the way in the beginning. What Dylan's talking about is um, Early on, you will be, come on, here. So it's these marginal tax rates. So early on in your career, you're like making a, a, not too much money. So you would be paying a small amount in federal, in, in taxes. But later on in your career, when you make a lot of money, you would, you want to reduce the amount of taxes you pay on that large uh, income you have in this particular tax bracket. So let's say you're making more than $260,000 a year. Let's say you make $250,000 a year. If you take out of those 250,000, you put $30,000 in your RSP, then instead of having to pay 33% uh, on that $30,000, you'll pay 0% on that $30,000 as the, the difference. So in, when you make a lot of money, I guess <laughs> it's important, it, it's valuable to have some contribution room in your RSP to be able to kind of not pay these high income taxes. Um, the way I was looking at it, Dylan, was early in the year, if you pay your, if you top off your RRSP, then you get back some money that you can just put yeah. back, in, put into your TFSA. Um, so, sorry, that's Otis. Yeah, I, I think, you, yeah, just make sure you understand the tax efficiency of any move. Like, it's, it's not until you get a little further along and you start making a bit more money and you realize the impact that taxes have. And, um, you know, this is why they say, like, you know, most people are happiest earning, you know, just over $100,000 per year. Whereas if you're really killing yourself trying to, you know, take home $300,000 a year, like you're working far, far, far harder because you're in, you know, you're probably managing hundreds and hundreds of people, but your take home pay, you know, won't, won't be proportionally higher because you're, you're, you're paying a much higher rate of tax. So it's just important to understand the tax implications of anything you do. Yeah. Um, so my, the, the way I, when I pay RSPs, early in the year and do your taxes they pay you back positive amount that's proportional rsp and i'll take that amount and just dump it to my tfsa um so it's a this is this is how i was looking at it done so i was like okay 
you pay RSP, you can take that. Uh, but I think in the long, yeah, it, uh, you're right though. I, if you make a lot of money later in your career, it's probably important to have your RSP. Yeah, it's just, it, it, if, if you have money to do both, then it's tax efficient to do both. But if you only have money to do one, then it's worth it to yeah. save the RSP contribution uh -huh. room until you're going to be paying higher taxes. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Then I say invest in index funds for short-term investing. You can look at this high interest savings uh, the website. They have different types of GICs with different types of uh, returns. Um, and if you want to buy a house, use your RSP. This is, this is actually another one, interesting one, Dylan. So let's say for 10 years, you invest, if you don't, if you don't save money, um, into your RSP, you can, you can take the money out of your RSP without paying taxes or, and it's this home buyer plan. The, yeah, the problem is in, in Vancouver, especially, but I think now even across the board, it's like the amount of money is just so small. It's kind of meaningless. Like if you think about, you know, the advantage that gives you kind of tax wise, it works out to like, you know, several thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, before when the houses prices were like $200,000 and you could take $20,000 out of your RSP, it was significant amount. Nowadays, it's kind of, is you're, you're right, it's probably less, less impact. Yeah, and the, the really depressing thing about house prices is just, and you know, I don't mean to be depressing and maybe this will change, but it's just that kind of no matter what you did, the only thing that mattered over the past 15 years was that you got in early. Like it, it didn't, you know, the people who did the best were the ones who were just like totally ridiculously over leveraged, like unsustainably, and they got rewarded, you know, because the housing prices have just skyrocketed. So it's, it's kind of unfortunate that way. And it was also this. So where the heck they have? So when I was talking about, the, they wrote this trend of decreasing interest rates. So they're over leveraged, but the, because the interest rates are decreasing every time they would take a loan out, they would have to pay less in their in interest. Um, and house prices would keep going up. Uh, so you can actually use your equity in a in a house to buy another house. And I think that's about it. So yeah, stay start early if you can. The earlier you save, the more that particular saving amount is gonna make over the long term with, with uh, you know, exponential growth, keep saving. Yeah, they diversify. This is, this is this kind of the rules. There is nothing too complicated, hopefully. If you guys have questions, yeah, you can put them in Discord or wherever. So I think this is for the more important slide. So the course notes for the, score, the CS07 uh, slide deck is here. Um, I really encourage you guys to watch this. This is a 30 minute or uh, video by Dre Dalio how he explains how the economy works. And then uh, these are different podcasts. So I don't know if you go out exercise or on your jog or whatever you do, wash dishes, you can listen to this in the background. Morningstar is one of these com companies that provides uh, analysis on different types of stock, but this is a, a, a layman kind of perspective podcast. They talk about all kinds of different things. If you if you want to read more, I think this is these are important. And then uh, these I think are going to be more relevant to the next talk. So yeah, the, tomorrow I don't know how many of you will attend. Uh, I want to talk a bit of kind of a much bigger picture. What the heck do we mean by money and value and kind of how how does money fit into our life? To, tomorrow's the interesting talk. Yeah, today was kind of the the apply. Yeah, this this one is the spreadsheet talk. Tomorrow is the the political <laughs> economy talk. Yeah. Uh, so that's about it. I don't know if you guys want to stick around or not. Uh, but yeah, that's so. I had I, you guys can take a look at the <laughs> things. Uh, you don't see the you can take a look at the, the slides on startup. Um, I think the most important one is if you start something, think very carefully about what you're doing and set a time limit to how much you're going to get stay involved with that startup. Uh, because a lot of times startups have this, uh, side effect of just kind of dragging on and on and on. Uh, and you're, you, you're, you have a limited amount of uh, energy in your life and you, life is not just about working. So you wanna, you wanna be careful. If you do wanna start a startup, you wanna be very explicit about, yes, these are the things I'm foregoing to go into this particular business. And I'm expecting that I will be successful in this amount of time. And if it's, that's not the case, I think you should just cut your losses and kind of, uh, call it a good experience and move on. Um, this is this kind of, I guess, my lesson. I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, it has been a bit too explicit, but uh, yeah. 
Um, I, I, I would agree with that. I think you'll probably talk about this tomorrow. I'd say even yeah. before tomorrow's talk, I would just encourage everybody to think about, think about all the people you know in your life and w w which of those people are happy and which of those people are unhappy, which of those people have a lot of money or make a lot of money and which of those people don't and what's the correlation between those two. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'll put these uh, slides up online. Uh, they are already online, and I'll probably upload this. At, well, we'll see. I might upload this video at some point. We'll have to see. Uh, all right, guys. So, oh wait, there's somebody in chat talking. Here, let me let me stop recording for a sec.